IPOs 101. IPOs for dummies. All right, I needed it once, relaying it to y'all because Investopedia can be hard to understand. Here we go. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna break this down into five distinct points here. IPOs explained, the history of IPOs, how IPOs work, which is different, uh, and, I, and you'll see. <laughs> Internal procedures behind an IPO, and then advantages and disadvantages of taking your company public. All right, here we go. So yeah, first of all, what is an IPO? IPO stands for Initial Public Offering. It's just when shares of a company are made available to the public for the first time. Um, before that, there will just be angel investors, venture capitalists that are in a company. Afterward, the public, anybody who wants to can buy it. Uh, they provide companies with a opportunity to generate more capital through shares. That just means if you have 10 investors that all have put in $1 million, you have $10 million. But if you can then list a million of shares at $50 each, you suddenly have $50 million instead of just the 10. Uh, requirements set by the SEC must be met in order to offer shares to the public. And no surprise there to anybody, SEC is going to be breathing down your neck if you're on the stock market. Uh, and they are often an exit strategy for founders and early investors. So like I just said, if you have a bunch of angel investors that are all in for a million, they've been with your company for three, five, 10 years, however long it's taken to grow up to a point where you feel comfortable to IPO, and then you do IPO, you can often cash them out if they want to be cashed out, or as we'll see later, uh, sometimes their ownership can just be converted to shares at the market price. Um, yeah, history of IPOs. Uh, Dutch had the first modern IPO. The Dutch East India Company, August 1602, went public. Uh, this picture included on this slide here is um, the actual issuance to the public for if they wanted to buy shares of the Dutch East India Company in 1600. Found that interesting. Uh, they've increased and decreased a lot in number over the years. Uh, during the dot-com bubble, it was like the most IPOs per year in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, companies were just flying out of everywhere on the dot-com bubble, and uh, all of them were quickly successful right up until about that 2008 recession. Uh, there, was, there was lots and lots of IPOs happening. After the 2008 recession, uh, obviously, IPOs went down, uh, particularly in 2008. That was like the lowest year since uh, the Great Depression for new IPOs launching. Um, and today, most of the time, IPOs are focused on unicorns, which is companies with a $1 billion valuation. Uh, you can also IPO with a lower valuation that uh, if you have a strong business, have been around for a while, or meet, meet another subset of criteria, but $1 billion is generally the loose rule of thumb right now. Uh, and if you are worth less than a billion dollars and trying to IPO, tech companies have the easiest time doing that, which is no surprise to anybody. How IPOs work. So yeah, this is just, this is the steps you know, this is sort of on the on the public side of things as well. But um, initially, companies are private, only has angel investors, venture capitalists, as I mentioned earlier. And then when they are mature enough that they think they can survive SEC regulations, which uh, they begin the IPO process. Shares are priced through due diligence. Uh, this is obviously very subjective, but lots of SEC experts and CPAs and regulators look at the company and how it will be perceived by the public and a variety of other factors that's all the due diligence that goes into pricing the shares for an IPO. And as we discussed before at length on the show, often they're not priced right and it will price itself in. That's the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, private ownership is converted into shares at their market price after the IPO. That's what I was saying earlier as well. Angel investors that already have money in, they can either cash out, usually for a profit, or they can convert their share, their uh, holdings into shares at the market price and let the stock price dictate what happens with their value after that. Uh, this is the five steps to going public from the internal side. Uh, and this is our, our wordiest slide, but it's really not that intimidating. Um, and this is actually listed as eight steps. Most places that you look, I combined one through three and seven and eight. Uh, so step one or one, two and three, however you want to look at it, proposal, underwriter and team. Uh, underwriters are selected. They present proposals and valuations on the best type of security to issue, price, quantity of shares, time frame for release of shares, everything. Uh, and then teams are formed of underwriters, lawyers, CPAs, and SEC experts within a company that all work together to lead the charge in trying to go public. Uh, documentation is needed. S1 registration statement is the primary form of documentation. Uh, it just contains preliminary information like price that you're thinking, quantity of shares you're thinking, date you're thinking all of that stuff which is all subject to change after the s1 registration statement is filed uh, the s1 registration statement is you just kind of saying okay we are taking a hard step we want ipo for sure like we're sure about this 
Uh, then marketing phase, uh, this is widespread and especially in the modern era of marketing has, has just become even crazier. Uh, but I felt I did not need any further elaboration. You market your IPO, you tell Forbes that you're going to IPO, you tell Reddit that you're going to IPO, whoever else, people get a hold of it. It markets itself sometimes if you're depending on the type of company that you have. But you got to make make the public aware that they are going to be offered the opportunity to buy shares from you. I uh, hope CNBC picks that up and, and does good things. Um, after that, you got to form a board of directors. This one definitely goes without saying. Need I say more? Uh, and then the last step is the shares being issued and then post IPO, which again is sometimes regarded as two steps. I just decided to throw it in here as one. Uh, capital received is recorded as shareholders equity on your balance sheet. If you've ever taken an accounting class, you are very familiar with SAG, stockholders equity, shareholders equity. Uh, and then some post IPO provisions may be put in place. Uh, some of those are like underwriters may have a certain time, for, time frame that they're allowed to buy shares in. Uh, and angel investors may be restricted from buying additional shares for a little bit of time. Um, all, all sorts of things like that can happen immediately post IPO to try to prevent market manipulation or insider trading. And then our last thing to discuss is advantages and disadvantages. Um, and this may look skewed towards the disadvantages. It's really not. Uh, IPOs generally are regarded as advantageous if your company is big enough to to do one. It's why, you know, 90% of billion plus, well, I don't know about billion plus, but certainly like $10 billion plus companies are uh, are publicly traded is because of the advantages. But there is disadvantages as well that can especially, especially come into play if you're IPOing too early or if you're a small company or have any chance of going under, et cetera. Uh, so advantages are access to more capital. Obviously, that's the primary advantage and the primary reason that most people IPO is just to get access to more capital. Uh, it also increases your prestige and your public image, um, and it increases transparency and therefore credit reputation, meaning that when all of your financials are public all the time, uh, creditors, banks, whoever, are way more likely to give you large sums of money when your public financials are there and consistent uh, versus- Yeah, they're, all, they're posted all over the place and you have the SEC auditing you several times a year. That's yeah, right. so they're, they're probably they can, pretty good. Yeah, they can trust that those numbers are legitimate. Uh, disadvantages, as Chase mentioned earlier, IPOs are a very expensive process. And if you're you know, a gigantic company, it's not gonna be too much of an implication, all of the costs that go into something like this. Uh, but if you are a unicorn, if you've just crossed your, your billion dollar valuation, if you know your, your cash flow maybe isn't there yet, or you're maybe not even in the green yet, it can be a not cost effective process and it's something worth consideration. Uh, the cost of maintaining a public company are ongoing and separate from usual business costs. You have to do all, you have to pay all types of things to the SEC. There's additional taxes when you're a public company. Everything costs go up uh, as a whole. Also, you, you need, you just have to create more positions, accountants, compliance teams, yes. um, legal, legal teams that are, you know, on retainer for you or, or if you hire a firm out, I guess. So, the number I'm seeing for upfront costs, by the way, is two and a half to 10 million. Uh, that's what's going to come out of pocket initially. Uh, and then, yeah, you're going to have to pay however much for compliance teams, legal teams, fees to the SEC, uh, HR, fucking accounting, um, whether you, you know, keep that in-house or not, um, that's up to you. Yeah, I'll worry of consideration. Uh, fluctuations in share price can also cause a distraction for just be distractions for management. Um, this is something that is just very realistic. I think anybody can see how, how that could happen. If you're a, if you're a CEO and uh, you become too concerned on simply inflating the share price uh, to, to look better over actually growing the company effectively, uh, that can be that can become a problem quickly. See Nicola. Um, and then financial accounting and tax information must be shared with the public and can help competitors. Uh, sharing it with the public is sort of up and down. That can be an advantage if you're doing well. It can be a disadvantage if you're not doing well. Maybe you are maybe you know you're going to have three down quarters to finally get to an up fourth quarter and uh, you know launch out of there. But in the public eye, you're just missing earnings over and over again. Harder to structure long-term targets like that. You have to try to meet expectations that are set outside of your company in a lot of cases. Um, but helping competitors is very much a real thing. Uh, your All of your financials have to be public and your competitors who know how to do it and have legal teams dedicated to doing only that can dive deep into your financials and figure out all the way down to things like who your vendors are, how much you're spending on what categories of your business. Uh, and if you're doing really well, your competitors can copy your model and try to grow more. 
who are doing really poorly, your competitors can can try to deviate and might gain an advantage on you that way. But yeah, that's uh that's what I got.